Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And today we're going to discuss an America racked with social upheaval, economic injustice, incredible levels of violence, staggering amounts of political corruption. We're going to meet an America filled with riots and burning cities and disease and crime and despair, an entire country pushed to the very brink of open revolution. But first, we're going to discuss America in the past. We're going to follow that outline right up above my head. So put that in your notes to serve as a framework for the information that's about to follow as we tackle America's industrial age. Now, traditionally, historians have divided the era into two sections, the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, with the Gilded Age being the period between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the 20th century, and the Progressive Era being the first two decades of the 20th century. But for our purposes here, we're going to treat the whole thing as a single integrated period of history, America's Industrial Age. And there are six features of America's Industrial Age that can really help you kind of understand what exactly it was. For one, it was a period of tremendous transformation, economic transformation, political transformation, social transformation. The entire economy reorganizes itself and then increases tenfold. The entire political structure is reordered. The social fabric of America itself is unwoven and reconfigured into a class structure. It's just a period of incredible transformation. Two, this is a period of monumental achievement. Americans do monumental things during this period. They build incredible buildings. They write incredible books. They paint incredible paintings. They fight incredible wars. All of these things took place during Industrial Age America. Three, this is a period of rapid economic growth, rapid creation of massive amounts of wealth. The country got very, very, very wealthy in this period, becoming, by the end of it, the most prosperous economy in the world, and the country became a great power in the world. But, this takes us to number four, this is also a period of massive wealth disparity. A very small number of Americans grew very, very, very wealthy, while a large number of Americans, as you can see there on the upper left, got very, very poor. This was a period of incredible economic disparity, where a small group of people got very wealthy and a large group of people got very poor. This is also a period of staggering political corruption, and everyone knew that the political structure was corrupt. This is a cartoon from the Gilded Age, which literally shows, you know, the U.S. Senate and the real bosses of the U.S. Senate giant bags of money. In that cartoon, we can see these giant bags of money, each of them representing a trust, which is an organization of several different large corporations. And these huge bags of money are looking down on the senators that they have purchased. There's the steel trust, the standard oil trust, the copper trust. And you can see the tiny little senators in the cartoon looking over their shoulder making sure they serve their own bosses, these, these giant bags of money. This is also a period of tremendous violence. Two American presidents are assassinated during this period. Uh, James Garfield there in the upper left and William McKinley right up above me. And it's not just presidents being assassinated. This is a period of massive labor unrest, incredible riots, like the Haymarket riot in Chicago where it, this erupts between a fight between striking workers and police, and the police are firing revolvers and shotguns into the crowd, and the workers are tossing lit sticks of dynamite at the police. Incredible amounts of violence. And the same period covers the actual Wild West, you know, with six shooters and posses and outlaws. All of these things took place during Industrial Age America. In fact, we'll get to the Wild West. It's actually better understood as part of the Industrial Revolution. There are two major wars of empire fought in this period. The Spanish-American War in 1898 and the very, very brutal Philippine War uh, that followed from 1899 to 1902. Really two awful major wars. And this is just the major wars. There's also about a half dozen smaller military conflicts which take place across the American West 
Geronimo's War, the Great Sioux War, the pursuit of the Nez Perce, as the U.S. Army closes in on the last free Native Americans inside the United States. Because this is the period of the last of the Indian Wars. And by the time we get to 1900, there are no more free nations of Native America located inside the United States. But all of this violence and corruption aside, this was also a glorious age. It is a period of staggering art, incredible literature, beautiful poetry, stunning architecture. The Industrial Age becomes the standard by which all other periods of American art and culture would be judged, up to and including, you know, what some consider the greatest American novel ever written, Huckleberry Finn. And these are those monumental achievements of science and engineering. The uh, Statue of Liberty herself is set on her plinth in New York Harbor, even though she's French, you know, Americans put her there. One of the great engineering triumphs of the age is the Brooklyn Bridge, as well as the Intercontinental Railroad, a single railroad connecting New York City to San Francisco and joined in 1869 by a golden spike. This was an age of extremes, an age of extremes in everything. Extreme accomplishment, extreme brutality, extreme beauty, extreme ugliness, extreme wealth, extreme poverty, beautiful dresses, and incredible cruelty. And there you have the rich and the beautiful and the powerful having their wonderful evening meal. And at the same time, a hundred miles away, there's your collection of 11-year-olds on their way to work in the coal mine. An age of extremes. And people knew it at the time. They recognized that something was happening in America that had never happened before. And here is one of the cartoons denoting the differences. Here is that same dinner party we saw earlier, except here the rich and the powerful have been depicted as dogs. And they're not even useful dogs. They're not, not mutts or retrievers or shepherds. These are the tiny little dogs that rich ladies carry in purses, whippets, and that dude's a pug. And that lady's a, a trembling hate rat, you know, a chihuahua. That the, the rich and the powerful are a little more than these cosseted, pampered, tiny little dogs that actually can't even do any real work. And the entire period was named by uh, Mark Twain himself. Samuel Clemens is, of course, his real name. Generally considered to be one of the greatest writers in American history, if not the greatest writer in American history. That's what Ernest Hemingway called him the greatest writer ever. Um, Mark Twain himself, Samuel Clemens, uh, wrote a book together with his friend of his name, Charles Warner. And the book was called The Gilded Age. And the plot of the novel itself is very interesting. The plot of the novel involves this family in Missouri which is trying to get this dam built uh, back in their home state. So they go to Washington, D.C., and the entire family is just sort of sucked into this vortex of, like, corruption and despair and crime. And there's, like, a love affair, and there's a murder, and there's a trial. And basically the point, the entire thesis of, of the Gilded Age is basically just how incredibly corrupt the federal government had become during this period. And, you know, it's not many writers that get to, to name an entire period of American history. But Mark Twain did. This, these, the decades at the end of the 19th century are named after this book that Mark Twain wrote, The Gilded Age. So let's actually take a moment and meet Mark Twain himself. There he is, Mark Twain. His real name is, of course, Samuel Clemens. He was born in 1835 and he died in 1910. And you've probably had Mark Twain inflicted on you at some point. Generally considered one of the greatest writers in American history. He was born in a very humble family in Missouri. Literally comes from a family of, of what they would call poor white trash. Uh, he was raised in the antebellum South. You know, he knew enslaved African Americans. He knew very hard living. Uh, during the Civil War, he served very briefly in the Confederate Army. And then after the war, he became a newspaper reporter in the Wild West, eventually ending up 
in San Francisco. And from uh, writing newspaper articles, he eventually went on to write novels, and he became a really famous and acclaimed author. He's one of the first Americans to write a novel on a typewriter. He wrote more than uh, 30 major books, and then hundreds of smaller short stories, articles, and opinion pieces. You've probably heard of his more famous novels, Huckleberry Finn, you know, the semi-autobiographical Tom Sawyer, and of course, The Gilded Age, which I've just described. And he was very, very, very witty. You know, he smoked, he liked to smoke cigars, and he said about quitting, he says, quitting cigars is easy. I've quit dozens of times. So he's a, he's a very, very witty author, but he's also very cynical. He's very pessimistic. He's very dour. And he is, in fact, the opposite of the next person we're going to meet in terms of uh, industrial age America. Because the mirror opposite of Mark Twain is Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. And he didn't like being called Teddy. He preferred being called T.R. or the Colonel, which was his military rank. Teddy Roosevelt is the complete opposite of Mark Twain. Mark Twain was born into poverty in Missouri. Teddy Roosevelt was born into wealth in New York City. His family is very wealthy. Um, but he walked away from this life of wealth and comfort. Uh, his first wife and his mother die very close to one another. And in a moment of depression, he basically just completely walks away. And he abandons all of this money to go be a cowboy in the Dakotas. So he's a cowboy in the Wild West. He rides the range, he fixes fences, he shoes horses, he herds cattle. He does all of that stuff as a young man. And eventually he becomes a writer. He becomes a historian writing a very acclaimed history of the War of 1812. He becomes a naturalist writing books about hunting and enjoying nature. You know, there it is, Theodore Roosevelt, good hunting, how to hunt big game in the American West. And he returns from the Wild West uh, in 1886 and enters politics uh, in New York City, eventually becoming the police commissioner of New York City. And then in 1898, he resigns as police commissioner because America has gone to war uh, with the empire of Spain. And he forms the Rough Riders and he becomes a war hero in the Spanish-American War. I mean, he wins the Congressional Medal of Honor the only president in American history to have won the Congressional Medal of Honor, even though it's not given to him in, like for, in, for decades after his death. At any rate, he returns from the war as this big war hero and then enters politics in a major way, becoming a reform-minded governor of New York State. And then he is eventually placed on the vice presidential ticket, and then he becomes president of the United States. Indeed, he's generally regarded as one of the greatest presidents in American history. I mean, he's right up there on Mount Rushmore with Lincoln and uh, Washington and Jefferson and Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he's known as the philosopher president because he writes these books about philosophy, about the best way to live your life in a way that gives you meaning and happiness. And, you know, his philosophy is right there, The Strenuous Life by Theodore Roosevelt. And he wrote very seriously about the best ways to live one's life. And like I said before, he's the complete mirror opposite of Mark Twain. Mark Twain is cynical. Mark Twain is dour. Mark Twain is depressed. Theodore Roosevelt is positive. He is optimistic. He is energetic. He is everything Mark Twain is not. And Theodore Roosevelt and Mark Twain cannot stand one another. These two men hate each other with a passion. And these two guys... You know, we're going to follow these two guys through the end of the, of the 19th century in America because they both represent very different views of the era. But we're going to meet a third person who is completely different from both Mark Twain and Theodore Roosevelt, an emigrant from Russia. And her name is Emma Goldman. She was born in 1869 in Tsarist Russia, and she eventually dies in 1940. She is an immigrant, like many people of the era. She was fleeing the anti-Semitism of Tsarist Russia. She's 16 years old when she comes into New York City in 1885. And she lives in intense poverty in New York City. She has a very, very poor upbringing. She gets a job as a seamstress in one of these huge nightmarish factories where she experiences firsthand 
the cruelty of factory life, the economic injustices of the period. She witnesses some of these horrible accidents that took place in these factories. But she read voraciously. She's largely self-educated. And as she's watching workers be mistreated, you know, by these big corporations, by these factory owners, she becomes attracted to these really violent uh, political movements. She's present at the Haymarket riot, we, you know, when the striking workers are battling policemen with guns and dynamite are being thrown back and forth. She becomes an activist. She becomes a historian. She becomes a political philosopher of a movement known as anarchism because she sees how the corporations and the trusts are manipulating the government to their own ends. And she arrives at the conclusion that if we want to make society better, the very first thing we should do is abolish the entire government. It can't be reformed. It can only be destroyed. And there is her uh, quote right up above my little yellow box. I'll read it to you right now. All forms of government rest on violence and are therefore wrong and harmful as well as unnecessary. This is the, this is the philosophy of anarchism. She is arrested a dozen times throughout the industrial age. And finally, she is formally deported in 1919. She becomes the revolutionary so dangerous that they kick her out of the country. And she spends the rest of her life in Europe. She uh, never returns to the United States during her lifetime. So what I want you to do is as we move through the industrial age, I want you to be building an answer to that question right there. You're going to evaluate this entire period of American history. Write this question down in your notes and keep it revolving in your head as we move through, you know, the, the, the information about this period in American history. America's industrial age, golden, gilded, or dark. Evaluate the historical events between 1860 and 1920 in terms of society, politics, and the economy and develop an argument that supports one of these three interpretations on this critical period in American history. I'm not going to give you an answer to that question. You're going to study this period of American history and build your own answer. And ultimately, though, like, why does it matter? Why are we going to spend so much time talking about, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt and Andrew Carnegie and Rosa Goldman? Emma Goldman, why, what are we going to do? And, and it, the industrial age matters for two reasons. Uh, one is that the industrial era was a period in American history like none before it. Nothing had ever happened like this to the United States. I mean, look at those charts right above my head. Industry increased by more than tenfold. The American population tripled. Both the economic and social structure of the United States, of the modern U U.S., formed at this period. The old society, old American society was stretched beyond all recognition and the country began to assume the shape that it is in uh, today. I mean, we can look at these pictures from the late 19th century and it's things start to look like modern America. There in the upper left, that is, you know, New York City in 1896. You know, you can see it. It's got buildings. Some of these buildings start to get quite tall. It's got paved roads. It's got street lights. You know, right up above me, there is the 45-star flag of uh, 1896, right up above me. Things are starting to look like they do today. Factories look like factories. By the time we get to the end of the industrial era, uh, you know, this period of history, in this period of history, the United States had never experienced anything like this before. And modern America emerged from this industrial age into a country that we can begin to recognize today. The second reason it matters is that secondly, out of all of the periods of American history, the industrial age most strongly resembles our own current era. In fact, in many ways, we are now living in the second Gilded Age. And this is not my idea. Lots and lots of people have pointed this out. I mean, look at these articles and stories right up above my head, you know, dragging America out of its second Gilded Age. America's second Gilded Age, more class envy than class conflict. And there on the far left, a second Gilded Age, the promises and perils of an analogy. Many people have pointed out 
the great number of similarities between our time and industrial age America. In the late 19th century, America underwent an industrial revolution that reshaped the economy, that reshaped society. Tw early 21st century America is now undergoing a digital revolution that is reshaping the economy, that is reshaping society. In the late 19th century, we had enormous disparities of wealth and power. In the early 21st century, we have great disparities in wealth and power. Both the Industrial Revolution in the 19th and the Technological Revolution in the 21st have produced an enormous amount of wealth. They both produced incredible wealth. But that wealth has been concentrated at the very top of society. And this has produced very large-scale income inequality. We have a level of income inequality here in the United States that we haven't seen you know, since the 1880s, since the 1890s, since the early 1900s. I mean, look at that chart on the upper left. That's the growth of the American economy. It's spectacular. It's increased, you know, almost tenfold in the last 40 years. But look at the distribution of that wealth right up above me. The top 5% of the American society control something crazy like, uh, you know, 72% of, of all the wealth in the United States. Is controlled by a tiny minority of people. And the top 1% of people in the United States control almost half the economy, 43%. I mean, it's incredible. And like the 19th century, this explosion in wealth has had no real significant impact on household income, uh, on the household income of most Americans, you know, over the last 20 years. Again, look at that chart. You know, adjusted for inflation, the average income of Americans in the year 2000 was you know, about $59,000. And then we get to today, 21 years later, where the average, you know, income for Americans adjusted for inflation is, is $59,000. Income has been flat over the last 20 years, despite the fact that the country has produced an enormous amount of wealth. And in the American cities of the 21st century, just like the American cities of the late 19th century, the ultra-rich live right next to to the ultra poor. In the upper left, that's a drawing from the Gilded Age. It's a drawing from about 1880. There you have very fancy, very fancy people, a very wealthy man emerging, you know, at dawn, emerging from his bar with a pair of beautiful women on each arm, you know, on their way about town. And you can see them passing right in front of a pair of very, a poor immigrant family on their way to work. And there you go in the bottom left hand. That was during New York Fashion Week. There we've got very skinny, very beautiful models getting their picture taken in New York. And a dirt poor homeless guy squatting on the steps next to them. Just like the 19th century is now just like the 21st century. The 19th century had these ultra rich, ultra powerful people that became known as the robber barons. People that controlled those huge bags of money from the cartoon incredibly powerful capitalists. Andrew Carnegie, the man that controlled U.S. Steel. J.P. Morgan, the man who ended up controlling the bank trust, the money trust of the New York banks. Cornelius Vanderbilt, who built a fortune out of railroads. And the wealthiest American in American history, John D. Rockefeller, who ended up controlling 98% of American petroleum production and distribution. Back in the 19th century, they had the robber barons. And in the early 21st century, we have the tech barons, people that control incredible amounts of money, all coming out of the digital revolution. Uh, there in the upper left, that's a, that's a list of the nine wealthiest people in the world. Seven of them are American. And all of this huge amount of money has come from the digital revolution. There's Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Zuckerberg. All of this money is coming out of the digital revolution. And again, this is not my idea. Uh, this is not my crazy opinion that I'm trying to force on you. Many, many, many people have pointed this out, that the modern tech barons are just like the old robber barons, you know, back in the industrial age. You know, the new tech moguls, the modern robber barons, robber barons and silicon sultans, the tech giants are the robber barons of our time. Again, the industrial age is the period in American history most similar to our own. 
There was staggering political corruption in the late 19th century. There is staggering political corruption in the early 21st century. In fact, this is going to blow the minds of a lot of young people, but the American political structure didn't used to be this corrupt, and we have the quantitative data to prove it. If you look at that chart right up above me, that's uh, uh, the conviction of elected officials. And you can see that it has just increased by leaps and bounds, you know, since the 1970s and 1980s. And corruption is just absolutely rampant and is concentrated in American cities. You can see there on the chart uh, on the upper left, the most corrupt cities in America and leading the pack, New York City. Actually, number one is Chicago. But what they did is they broke New York into three separate categories. So there we go. Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami, Washington, D.C. All of these cities are just incredibly, incredibly corrupt. And there you have the picture on the lower left. That is the governor of Illinois being convicted of racketeering on his way to federal prison. That's uh, George Ryan, uh, the ex-governor of, of Illinois. And uh, George Ryan was succeeded uh, by the next governor who also went to federal prison, uh, Rod Blagojevich. So Illinois had two governors in a row. Each of them went to federal prison on corruption charges. Now, specifically, Rod Blagojevich, a very interesting case. Uh, okay, that fellow next to uh, Governor Blagojevich, that's Barack Obama, you know, the, pre the 44th president of the United States. He got elected president, but before he was president, he was a senator. Now, in the United States, uh, when a Senate seat becomes vacant, like the senator becomes president, it's up to the governor to choose anyone he wants to be senator. And apparently what Rod Blagojevich did is he began to auction off the Senate seat. He began to circulate, like, who will pay me the most money and I will make them a U.S. senator. But what he didn't know is that the FBI was listening in the entire time. And that is a quote from Governor Bogoyevich on the upper left. The Senate seat is an effing valuable thing. You don't just give it away for nothing. Uh, and he was convicted in 2008. I think he was pardoned in uh, 2020, though. At any rate, we don't know the extent to which Barack Obama was involved in auctioning off his old Senate seat. Uh, he denies any involvement, uh, but a lot of people think that he was actually involved uh, in, in, in the bribery scandal. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I have no idea. But we have when you've got two governors in a row being convicted of bribery, things are not going well staggering levels of political corruption, just like in the late 19th century. And just like the late 19th century, tremendous violence, riots, burning city, the greatest CNN Chiron of all time, a reporter standing in front, standing in front of a burning city saying that the protests are mostly peaceful. It's, it's incredible, incredible. Uh, Chicago has become the most dangerous city in America with its uh, the number of murders outpacing the national increase. You know, the joke is that Chicago is Chirac, you know, because it's like Iraq. There we have another burning American city with a Black Lives Matter protest sitting in front of a, a, a wall where it's spray painted kill cops, just like the Haymarket riot of the 1880s and 1890s. Now, Americans have responded in predictable but still alarming ways. You've got riots, you've got crime, you've got burning cities, and Americans have gotten strapped. National gun sales are now at a historic high. In fact, the only period in American history where gun ownership is reaching these kind of levels is the Wild West. We are literally rearming ourselves just like we did in the 1870s and 1880s, where every cowboy carried a shooting iron. Both periods have even had their little wars of empire. Like, mentioned, like I mentioned earlier, you know, America's industrial age had the Spanish-American War and then the very ugly Philippine War. The early 21st century has had the Iraq War, which I will still argue that we won, even though a lot of people will disagree with me. And we had the relatively quick and successful Iraq War, followed by the very long and very ugly uh, Afghanistan War. And you can make an analogy. That was our Spanish-American War. That was our Philippines War. 
Uh, even though we sort of kind of won the Philippines War and we sort of kind of lost the Afghanistan War. Uh, but it depends on your perspective. One of the things they had in the late 19th century was something called yellow journalism. And these were newspapers that were printed and the paper was so cheap that after a day or two it actually became yellow. And the yellow journalism of Hearst and Pulitzer, we'll meet those guys later, Basically, they would, their job was to sell papers, and they didn't mind just making up the most crazy news to do it. They were just interested in selling copies. So the, the yellow journalism of the late 19th century basically just made stuff up. And you can see the little cartoon of the jester just throwing out of the printing press venom and lies and scandal. You just couldn't trust the news much much like you can't trust the news today. The late 19th century had yellow journalism. The early 21st century, we have fake news where these news organizations after news organizations just invent stories just to sell copy, just to get the clicks on their website, just to get people watching their, you know, watching their news. Every major news organization from CNN to the New York Times has had some sort of massive fake news scandal where they just got caught out of whole cloth inventing stories. And no one is immune from this. So I want you to keep this in mind as we move through industrial age America, as we study industrial America and your opinions about industrial age America are to some extent your opinion about our current era, because the late 19th century is kind of an accurate reflection of our own time. Weird, but true. So we've got this question. America's industrial age, golded, gilded, or dark? So you're gonna evaluate the historical events of the period between 1860 and 1920, in terms of politics, in terms of society, in terms of the economy, and you're gonna decide America's industrial age was a golden age, or it was a gilded age, or it was a dark age. And your evaluation of the industrial age is to some extent your judgment of our modern, of modern America. So exactly what do I mean by these things? What do I mean by golden age, gilded age, dark age? Let's review those. What is a golden age? If you decide that this was a golden age in American history, then your thesis would be something like this. America's industrial era was a golden age. Now, a golden age, it's, it's in all caps, you know it's important. A golden age is a period in a nation's history. And it's this period of history where it is unprecedented wealth, unprecedented power, unprecedented artistic and cultural achievement. This is what's called a golden age. And here are some golden ages, like classical Greece, of, you know, from about 500 to 300 BC. This is the Greece of Athens, of Sparta, of Aristotle, of King Leonidas, of Plato, of Socrates. This was a period of unrivaled prosperity and accomplishment in classical Greece. Or Imperial Rome, AD 1 to about AD 200. You know, the Roman Empire, which at its height ext extended all the way from Great Britain, you know, to the, to the middle of the Middle East. It was a period of where the Roman Empire was the most advanced culture on earth. It was the largest empire the world had ever seen. This is the Roman Empire of Augustus, of Tiberius, of Virgil, of Tacitus. All of these great historians and great artists building incredible structures, building this incredible empire. This was the golden age of the Roman Empire. When you think about Rome, people think about that period of Roman history but I don't want to just limit it to classical civilizations. There is the Islamic Golden Age, which is roughly the centuries between AD 700 and AD 1200. Again, a period of unprecedented wealth, unprecedented power, unprecedented artistic, cultural, and intellectual achievement. During the Islamic Golden Age, the empires of Islam extended all the way from Spain to India. They invented mathematics. Algebra is in fact an Arabic word. They studied the stars. They built these incredible buildings. They made domes of buildings out of gold. When you think of the of you know of medieval Islam, that is what you think of. Now, a golden age is not perfect. 
all right? It doesn't have to be like a utopia. I mean, classical Greece treated women very, very poorly. Imperial Rome was super gung-ho into slavery. The Islamic Golden Age imported African slaves by the millions and waged brutal wars of conquest across Central Europe. A Golden Age isn't a utopia, but it is a period of incredible wealth, power, uh, artistic, cultural, and intellectual achievement. So as we move through this, this material, if you decide this is a golden age of America, this will be your thesis right up above me. America's industrial era was a period of unrivaled economic growth and wealth production. America was transformed from a small rural nation into one of the great powers of the world. It was a period of te technological innovation, artistic triumph, and literary excellence. This was America's golden age. And there's things to support that. The transcontinental railroad connecting an entire continent with a golden spike. The 1893 World's Exposition, which we'll meet in a little bit. This is a period of tremendous patriotism. The, um, the administration's promises have been kept. Together we built the statue, well, we placed the Statue of Liberty on an island in New York Harbor. We built one of the great fleets of the world, the Great White Fleet, where we took all of these American battleships and sailed them all the way around the world. It took two years for them to sail around the world. If this is your opinion, you have to be able to support that opinion when it comes to test time. But there's alternatives to viewing it as a golden age. There's Mark Twain's opinion. There's Mark Twain on the lower left. Mark Twain argued that this was a Gilded Age. In fact, that was his book, The Gilded Age. So what is gilding? Gilding is when you take something cheap. It's when you take something that's flawed and you paint it to make it look really valuable, but it's not. For instance, if you see there in the upper left, that's a plaster frame that has been painted to look like it's gold, but it's really just plaster. There the person is gilding a door. The door will eventually look like it's made out of solid gold, but it's really just cheap, half rotten pine. They're just painting it to look like it's gold. Right up above me is an iron ring. It's just been painted with gold paint. It's not a golden ring, it's gilded. For things to be gilded, it's for them to look really beautiful and look really impressive. But in, re in reality, they're cheap and rotten and corrupt and really not valuable at all. That was Mark Twain's opinion. And there's things to back this up. For instance, let's take railroads. Railroads define the era. The Intercontinental Railroad connected New York City to San Francisco. People could travel from one side of the continent to the other in a matter of days, and they could travel it in incredible luxury. You had these things called Pullman cars. They were specially made cars that could be attached to trains where you could just sit in comfort while you're traveling from one side of the country to another, sipping ice cold lemonade as you watch the country roll by. Truly incredible. But to Mark Twain, the accomplishments of the railroad and the beauty and comfort of a Pullman car was just gilding over a cheap and rotten interior. Because railroad workers were treated very, very poorly. The railroad itself was built with cheap Chinese immigrant labor. And every time the railroad workers or the railroad construction workers got out of hand, they were met with force and violence. Uh, the Pullman cars themselves, these beautiful, luxurious cars, were made by the Pullman factory. But to work for Mr. Pullman, he, you had to live in one of the houses that Mr. Pullman built for you. He wouldn't just be your boss, he would also be your landlord. And Pullman wasn't above lowering wages and raising rents at the same time. That's why you see that cartoon on the lower left. He is literally, in that cartoon, squeezing his workers cutting their wages at the same time, he's raising their rent. And this would result in really violent, powerful strikes, like the Pullman strike of 1894, where the Pullman workers went on strike, and when the soldiers in the private armies came to crush them, 
they just set the entire rolling stock of Pullman on fire. And they burned up hundreds of Pullman cars. It's the gilding on top of a cheap interior. There might be a lot of patriotism. There's Grover Cleveland on an American flag. There's James Blaine, who was the uh, Republican candidate who ran against Grover Cleveland. But James Blaine was one of the most corrupt political candidates in American history. He got swept up in a railroad scandal where it turns out the railroads had invented a company to defraud the U.S. government. There's a cartoon right up above me that shows literally them selling a U.S. Senate seat to the highest bidder, which is something that happened. So there might be a lot of patriotism. That's the gold paint. But underneath that patriotism, the entire political system is deeply, deeply corrupt. That's Mark Twain's opinion, that this was a Gilded Age. Or you could say, no, 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 no. It's not even the gilding works. Not even the gold paint can hide the cruelty and violence of the American Industrial Age. Others even disagreed with this, pointing out the cruelty, the violence, the dishonesty, the ugliness of the era. To them, America's industrial era was a dark age of oppression, of racism, of exploitation and extermination. They said, really, this is just the dark ages all over again. This was an era just like the dark ages of the medieval period, a period where despite all of these claims of democracy and progress, America was at its heart a deeply savage place where, quote unquote, write this down, the strong did what they wished and the weak suffered what they must. And again, there's some evidence to back this up. There's some evidence that supports this third thesis. Working inside these 19th century factories was very, very dangerous. Little kids would be employed to snatch little bits of thread out of these huge machines that were moving. And every now and again, those huge machines would grab one of those little kids and pull them right in. Many people would be sucked into these machines. Work injuries were commonplace. Sometimes entire factories would burn to the ground. People got very, very severely injured in these huge, horrible factories, missing legs or like this poor girl, her long hair got caught in one of the spinning machines and it pulled her right in head first. These factories were very, very dangerous. And these are the weak who suffered what they must. And efforts to improve safety, efforts to limit working hours, limits to restrict child labor, People who said, maybe we shouldn't have 11-year-old coal miners. These people were met with naked force, all right? When the workers went on strike, strikers were met with armed force, either from the U.S. Army itself or from a private police force known as the Pinkertons. The Pinkerton National Detective Agency, they started out as private investigators, but by the time we get to the industrial age, they are essentially a private police force for hire. If your workers go on strike in a factory and you don't want them to work, say, less than 70 hours a week, instead of meeting their demands, and if you are a wealthy capitalist, you can go out and hire the Pinkertons. And the Pinkertons will go in and beat the crap out of your workers for you to beat them until they go back to work. So there is something to say. This is a dark age of American politics. And this doesn't even include what happens in the South. My God, what happens in the South? In the South, the Bourbon Democrats used murder. They used lynching. They used control of local elections to build something called the Jim Crow South. The Jim Crow South was a rigid, racially segregated society that took African Americans and made them second class citizens, put them in a subservient role to the white Americans that lived in the South. And they did it in brutal, brutal fashion. African Americans eventually lost most, if not all, of the civil rights that had been promised to them during the Civil War. Hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of African Americans are extra-legally killed across the South, from Texas to Virginia. Killed brutally through terrorism 
through night raids and through the use of the Ku Klux Klan. And the Bourbon Democrats in the South celebrated this. They said, we have triumphed over people who want racism to stop. And this is, this is personified in one of the most popular books of the era, a book by Thomas Dixon Jr. called The Klansman. Now, I haven't read The Klansman. I don't really want to. But the plot of The Klansman is basically this. It's how the Ku Klux Klan saves America from black people. I'm not making that up. That's the plot of the book. All right? The Bourbon Democrats of the South celebrated their victory over African Americans. They were very proud of it. People didn't hide the fact that they were members of the KKK. So let's go back to our question. America's industrial age, golden, gilded, or dark? Pretty much it's going to come down with which of these three people you agree with. To Theodore Roosevelt, this was a golden age of American history. Unprecedented power, unprecedented wealth, unprecedented intellectual, technological, and engineering triumph. To Mark Twain, this was the Gilded Age. An era that superficially looks nice, but is really cheap and nasty underneath. To Emma Goldman, this was a dark age of cruelty, racism, and oppression. And the only thing to be done is to destroy it all and start over. So keep an answer to this question rotating in your head as we move through this material. Because you're going to be asked about this later as we get into the meat and potatoes of Industrial Age America next time. And I will see you there.